want to welcome everybody to today's webinar, Reaching Family Members in Today's Culture. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Larry Moyer. Uh, this is just a very timely uh, presentation. We've got uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas coming up very soon, uh, family members coming around the table. And if you're like me, you got several, several family members that you just would love to see come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And today, um, Dr. Larry Moore is just going to talk through a few different ideas to keep in mind to make that something that not we're not just thinking about, but some tactics that we can actually take to reach that family member in a little bit more of an effective way. So, so listen up and dig in. I think the content's going to be great. And with that, I just want to turn it right over to Dr. Moore. Well, as Brock has said, we're talking about reaching family members in today's culture. And I really emphasize today's culture because obviously it's different than it was 50 years ago. But one of the greatest desires believers have is to know that those who are part of their family on earth be part of their family in heaven. I understand that because after 27 years of praying, my own folks assured me of their salvation. But for me, though, family members are some of the most difficult ones to talk to about spiritual things, and particularly, and again, the day we're living in. I did a study last night of how thoughts have changed since just five years ago concerning people's view of the scriptures, view of Christ, etc. And so it's a different world we're living in. But how do you go about speaking to those of your own family, especially about the gospel of Christ? Well, to begin, I'd like to ask an awfully simple question that's worth talking about. And that's what's, what is it that makes reaching relatives so difficult? And I would propose that there are actually three different reasons. One reason is that you're talking about a very sensitive issue. By that I mean spiritual things is not a subject people discuss around the table. I've only known one home I've ever been in where they said we were free to talk about anything we want to around the table, even sexual matters. But the fact is that was the exception, not the norm, and spiritual things are not a subject people readily discuss. Now, a second reason is you're talking about a very personal issue. In other words, people have the attitude, your religion is my business, your religion is your business, my religion is my business. I grew up in that type of home where was a very personal issue, and you don't talk to people about their personal religion. The attitude is, you know, two things we don't talk about, politics and religion. And I would say particularly the area of religion. And it's a very personal issue that we feel we should not address with one another. Then the third thing is, and this is probably one of the biggest, you're talking about a very divisive issue. In Matthew 10, Christ said, do not think I've come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law, daughter against her mother, and daughter-in-law uh, against her uh, mother-in-law. In other words, it's a divisive issue. Uh, when it comes to uh, things like politics and other issues, the coming elections in today's culture, that you know what's happening today. No, the fact is people don't have to take a stand. When it comes to Christ, nobody said it any better than the late Billy Graham. No decision is a decision. Because John 3.18 says, he that believes not is condemned already. He that believes has eternal life. And But the fact of the matter is, it's a very divisive issue. And that's why it makes it so difficult, because you combine all those things. It's a sensitive issue. It's a personal issue. It's a divisive issue. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about, though, how do you reach family members of today's culture? And I would like to suggest that there are three don'ts, and I'd like to talk about what I call six do's. Now, obviously, with all of these, we could spend a lot more time on it if we had them. It would be easy to spend 30 minutes on each one of these, but we don't have that kind of time. So let me just summarize it and hopefully give you some food for thought. Okay, first of all, when it comes to the first don't, I would say, don't let Satan do what he is so good at. Don't let Satan do what he is so good at. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is Satan loves to intimidate us. He's a master intimidator. He loves to say, what are you going to do when they bring up your past? And he reminds you of all the selfishness, all the fits of anger, all the unkind attitudes, all the addiction to drugs, and a whole host of anything. Then he said, you know, what are you going to do when you bring that up? Well, the fact is, they're not likely to. 
But if they do, you use that for a bridge to the gospel. You simply say, please forgive me. But it's because of whom I used to be, I'm the light I've come to Christ. And I wish somebody would explain something to me sooner that I'd now love to explain to you. I, in my background, before I came to Christ, I had one fierce temper. I remember the day my mother said to me, better be careful. That's the thing that makes people murder. I lived in fear that then one day, an outburst of anger, I could actually do the kind of destruction. Well, I thought, when I thought, talked to my folks, I thought, what am I going to do when they bring that up? The fact is, they never did. All the states were trying to do is use that to intimidate me. And the fact is, they're not likely to bring up the past. But if they do, you simply use that as a bridge of dog and say, please forgive me. But because of who I used to be, I wish somebody would explain something to me sooner. I'd now like to explain to you. But the point is, don't let safety do as good at and as intimidation. Now, a second don't I would give in, that, uh, in this area is a forgiven person has both a right and responsibility to speak to anyone anywhere. In other words, the reason you don't let Satan intimidate you is because as a forgiven person, you have a right to speak to anyone anywhere. But you have to personalize Psalm 103 12 by saying, as far as the east is from the west, so far as we removed my transgression from me. And the fact is, it doesn't matter how Satan tries to intimidate you. As a forgiven person, you've got both a right and responsibility. I really emphasize those two words, a right and responsibility to talk to anyone, anywhere. And so for that reason, don't let Satan do what he's so good at, intimidate you. Now, a second don't is don't refuse to offer them forgiveness when God's forgiven you. Don't refuse to offer them forgiveness when God's forgiven you. Now, what I mean by that is they need to see your forgiveness if they're going to see his. If they're going to see his forgiveness, they need to see yours. When you talk about today's culture, I mean, people have been victims of child abuse, um, alcohol addiction, drug addiction, dysfunctional families. When we see people come to Christ or outreaches, they come from the, some of the worst backgrounds I've ever seen them come from in 49 years. The problem is, though, sometimes God forgiven us, but we can't forgive them. And if they don't see God's your forgiveness, it's unlike they're going to see his. Colossians 3.13 says it very plainly. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. He did not say you ought to consider doing. He said you got to do it. You must do it. You don't refuse them the forgiveness that God has given you. And that's why as you even listen to this webinar, may I talk as a brother in Christ and say to you, that if you're holding a game thing against any family member because of something happened in the past, and again, particularly in today's culture and where they're coming from, don't go to bed tonight before you get that resolved before the Lord. Because if they don't see your forgiveness, it's unlikely they're ever going to see his. And point is, don't refuse to offer them forgiveness. God's forgiven you. Now, a third don't is don't limit what God can do or who he can do it with. Don't limit what God can do or whom he can help. Now, the reason I say that is, if most of us were honest, I think we admit that we can see just about anybody and everybody come to Christ except our own relatives. And sometimes the reason is awfully simple. You know, we tried so many times to speak to them. They did not listen. Reflect upon conversations that have been very discouraging. And we see them as one of the most hardened uh, unbelievers that you'd ever want to meet and again in today's culture some don't feel there's a scripture as the authority they did years ago some don't see themselves in sinfulness the way they did years ago you know i'm not bad as most people so we think of all that we just can't see how they can possibly come to christ well what i'd encourage you with is this god has not met anyone his heart did not love or his arm could not reach and you have a chance, meditate on Acts 9, the story of when Saul, the persecutor, became Paul, the preacher. <laughs> in other words, God got through to him. And I think if you had said to anybody in that day, do you see Saul ever come to Christ? I really think that he said, no, not that guy. But the fact is, 
God, because he was a person who, as Acts 9, 1 says, would breathe threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. And so how would anyone like that come to Christ? And the fact is, if God can get through to Saul, he can get through to anyone, anywhere. And for that reason, there is not God, man, anyone his heart did not love or his arms could not reach. I mean, I would encourage you to think of your own past. I venture to say there are people in your past that probably said of you, you know, I can't see that person ever coming to Christ. And yet the fact is, were you today? You're a person who believes in Christ and looking forward to spending time with him forever. In the same way, God can get through to anyone, anywhere. Don't limit what God can do or he can do it with. Now, those are the three don'ts. Don't let Satan do what he's good at, intimidation. Don't excuse off for them the forgiveness God's forgiven you. And don't limit what God can do or whom he can do it with, whom he can help. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about the six do's. And again, each one of these I keep emphasizing, we spend so much more time on, but I hope that I'm giving you food for thought. Okay, first do is stay in your lane. Now, you say, Larry, what do you mean stay in your lane? What I mean by that is don't take God's responsibility on your shoulders. If your relatives are going to come to Christ, God has to bring them. I don't know of any verse in the entire Bible that God's telling you, bring your relatives to Christ. Only God can do that. God's asking you to send, bring Christ to your relatives. One of my favorite verses is John 6, 44. No one can come to me that the Father who sent me draws him. You know, be concerned about their salvation, but don't take the responsibility of their salvation upon your shoulders. You got to stay in your lane of responsibility. Now, I can identify the temptation to do that, the temptation to take that on your shoulders, because I came to Christ on a dairy farm in Pennsylvania, and I knew from the day I was saved, I wanted to be an evangelist. God in grace and favor I do not deserve had used me to lead so many to Christ. But I thought, I cannot even bring my own books there. And it dawned on me one day that I did not lead anyone to Christ. God led to Christ. I just brought Christ to them. And if my relatives were going to come to Christ, then God had to bring them. I could not take that responsibility on my shoulders. Your shoulders are not big enough to bear that kind of responsibility. Only his are. So they don't take that responsibility on your shoulders. Your responsibility is yes. Bring Christ to them. But God's responsibility is to bring them to Christ. And unless God through our works, they will never come. And God does not hold you responsible for bringing them to Christ. And don't take that responsibility on your shoulders. Now, the second thing I'd emphasize in terms of a do is also something that's often encouraging and refreshing, inspirational in my mind. Something a lot of people don't think of. And that is know that Jesus understands in other words he's been there done that he knows the agony of having family members who do not believe so many times we overlook john 7 verse 5 where it says even his own brothers did not believe in him now imagine growing up in the home with jesus and they're seeing his perfection they're seeing everything about him that would lend them to believe he is the one he said he was even his own blood brothers did not believe in him. So God knows what you're going through. God knows your feelings, your thoughts, your heartaches. He understands all of that. And so if you talk to God about the salvation of family members, remember, you're talking to somebody who understands the agony because he's been there and done that. And Christ's own family was not open to claims as members of your family may not open to them either. And simply know that Jesus understands the Savior you're going to be with forever. Who your best friend is someone who understands deeply what you're going through and just talk to him about it, knowing you talk to a heart that understands not only hear the ear that hears, but a heart that understands. So the second do is know Christ understands. Now, the third do is this be certain to ask the right question. Now, what I mean by that is. You're praying for God to give you an open door. You're praying for him to give you a chance to talk to them. You're praying for a good conversation. But as you interact about spiritual things, you got to be careful you ask the right question. Now, 
By that I mean the question is not, are you a Christian? In today's culture, there are multitudes, and I mean multitudes, that would say they're a Christian. People that, some of them of whom don't even darken the doors of a church. Some have no respect for the scriptures the way you and I do. They would call themselves a Christian. So when you say, are you a Christian? That's not the one to ask. Instead, you ask, have you come to a point in your life that you know, beyond any doubt, if you're to die, you go to heaven? Have you come to a point in your life that you know, if you're to die, you go to heaven? Because many people in today's culture who would say they're Christians would not admit to that. And if you say, are you a Christian? And they say, yes. If you go any further, you look like you're doubting their word. A person one time wrote to me and said, what do I do if I ask my dad, are you a Christian? He said, yes. I got a word back to him right away and said, whatever you do, don't ask that question. Because if they say yes, to go any further, it looks like you're disputing their word. And again, in today's culture, many would be apt to say yes. And the fact is, they don't really understand it. But instead ask, have you come to the point in your life that you know, if you're to die, you go to heaven. John 11, 25 to 26 is your basis for asking that question. Because there it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he may die, he'll live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Make that the issue. And that way you can explain if you're trusting Christ, then you're trusting the one who died and rose again. So what happens? You live as a person prepared to die. You die as a person prepared to live. Because he says, hey, I believe in me. He may die or live. But as you believe in me, you shall never die. And so when you trust Christ as a person, and that's the issue, then you can live prepared to die, die prepared to live. But you want to be careful to ask the right question. Because if you don't ask the right question, then it'll start steering you in the wrong direction. And instead, you want to ask the question, have you come to the point that you know if you die, you go to heaven? Because I cannot tell you how many people that I personally talk to who claim to be Christians. When I ask that question, they say, oh, no, I would not say yes. Or I would hope so, but or I think so. But most of the ones I talk to who would even claim to be Christians, and it's obviously they don't understand them, would not say yes to that question. I know for sure I'm going where I'm going when I die. And you have to make that the issue. Now, with that in mind, a fourth do is pray for another voice. Now, what do I mean by another voice? Anyone who spent a considerable amount of time in evangelism, as we hear in evangel, that's all we do, will tell you it often takes someone outside the family in, uh, to convince someone inside the family of a need for Christ. It often takes somebody outside the family. I cannot tell you how many people, God, again, in grace I do not deserve. I've been privileged to lead to Christ. And they're ones that family members have been trying to reach for years. And I'm convinced that one of the reasons they listen to me is I was not part of the family. I was not a son. I was not an uncle. I was not a dad. I didn't have any relationship to anyone in the family. And that was a difficulty receiving from them. They received from me. In fact, there are many times I've led people to Christ, and they have made a comment like, I don't know why I could not listen to my own brother. I don't know why I could not listen to my own father. I don't know why I could not listen to my own mother. I don't know why I could not listen to my own sister. And almost every time, you know what I've done? I said, you want to know why you listen to me instead of them? They said, yeah, why? I said, because I'm not part of the family. I'm not part of your family. You had trouble receiving it from them, but you did not have trouble receiving it from me. And for that reason, you pray for someone of an, another voice, because it often takes someone outside the family. Now, often when I bring that up, people don't question the sensibility of it, but they say, but I don't know of anyone they've contact with who's a believer. Keep in mind, God is still on the throne. He can bring someone to them tomorrow on a business trip, on a lunch, snack break, whatever. You had no idea he was going to bring across their path. One of the greatest letters I've ever gotten, I got them from a fiancé of a man. I was privileged to Christ on a plane. And I think it was about a couple of weeks later, 
I got a letter from his fiance, and she said, I'm a new Christian, and I've been, you led my fiance to Christ on a plane on the way to Dallas. There are times I talked to him, and he was open. There are times I talked to him, he was not. But you had to have privilege leading him to Christ. I was looking forward to a God-centered marriage. I'm a different person, and so is he. She had no idea on a plane to Dallas that God was going to pull me alongside of him to talk with him. And the fact that God can bring someone across their path today or tomorrow, you have no idea. You have no idea he's going to bring across their path. And for that reason, keep that in mind that God can bring someone across their path and pray for someone of another voice. Now, I always stress another voice, but in addition to yours. Or by no means am I not saying do your part. Do everything you can. But well, often it takes another voice and pray for someone in addition to you. Now, another do, do number five, consider an ultimate means of communication. Consider an ultimate means of communication. Now, by that, I have several things in mind. First of all, remember, verbal communication is not the only way to reach your relatives. You consider a text, a letter, or an email. I have had so many people that saw people respond in their family by text, a letter, and email. Now, don't forget, we're talking about today's culture. In today's culture, you not only have letters, you have texts and emails. Um, and the advantage of those instruments is unlike a conversation goes in one or out the other, something they're reading and reread, even if they may never tell you they got it. I give you so many stories of how God used emails and texts and letters to the people of Christ by such a vehicle. Now, you might be tempted to say, but Larry, which one of those we suggest I use? That's got to be your decision, not mine. And here's why. You choose a form of communication they are least likely to discard. Think of the form of communication they're least likely to discard. In other words, if they're apt to press delete on a button or an email, use a letter. At the same time, I know of a person who never ever checks their mailbox unless they have to. They don't even like to go to their mailbox. Well, that kind of person, you'd want to use an email. But you've got to decide which is the one they're less apt to discard. I had a person say to me one time, well, our, you know, my family and I, we never write letters to each other. And so I'd be better off to use an email. I said, no, wait a minute. You said you never write letters. So if they got a letter, wouldn't they be shocked? They said, yeah, they would. I said, wouldn't they be apt to read it? They said, probably because they never get a letter from me. I said, then I'd use a letter instead of an email. Because if they're less likely to if they discard it, that's what I would use. At the same time, like I just mentioned, if you're someone that they don't even check their mailbox, so to speak, or letters mean nothing, then use an uh, email or text. But you let decide. Now, with that in mind, I'll also say something else in this area. Regardless of what form of communication you use, be certain to do the following. And it doesn't matter if it's a text, an email, or a, a, a letter. Compliment them for what they meant to you. It doesn't matter who the relative is. There's something you can compliment about them. Then express your desire that two you'll be together in heaven. Say what means more to me than anything else is that we'd be together in heaven. And then explain the plan of salvation simply and clearly. Put it in your own words. In other words, if you're writing a letter, I would not enclose one of our May Ask a Question booklets. I'll say more about that in a minute. God used them in many in a mighty way. But I would not enclose that book in the letter. I'd write it out in your own words because you have to lay the booklet aside. Uh, if I did an email, I would not send an attachment. I'd put that booklet in your own letter, in your own words, in the email because they're more apt to read the email than they are the attachment. But the point is, explain the plan of salvation clearly. Compliment them, express your desire to do, be together in heaven, then explain the plan of salvation clearly. But concern also means communication. Now, number six, have a method to share the gospel. You've got to have a method to share the gospel. Now, why do I say that? Many times, you do not share the gospel with our family because we do not have a method for sharing Christ with anyone. And if you don't have a method to share Christ with anyone, you're most certainly not going to do it with your own family. Now, a method is something that makes you very warm and personal. 
You can go into it differently, come out of it differently, change your illustration, whatever. But a method does not make you canned. A method makes you caring. Because you can look at their, think through what you're saying. You can, if you're talking in person, you can look at them. And it's a way that gives you confidence and boldness in talking to them. But you got to have a method. Now, one option, of course, is a bad news, good news approach. Told I'm ask you a question. Many of you as athletes are autistic to Christ. In fact, I've been told many times that one of the best things we've ever done, help people reach their own relatives, was to simply introduce them to the bad news, good news approach. And if you had all day, and I sincerely mean all day, I can keep you that long telling you about people that are to Christ using the May I Ask a Question booklet as our bad news, good news approach. And the point is all making it, you got a method. Because one thing I've found out in traveling across the world is that people don't have a method. First of all, they don't talk to anyone. And secondly, they most definitely don't talk to members of their own family. Now, whatever method you use, I want to go back to something I said earlier about even uh, another means of communication. You want to make the gospel clear. Now, to make it clear, people got to understand three things. That we are sinners, Christ died for us, rose, and we have to trust in Christ alone not christ plus something else but christ period because on the cross he made the full payment not the down payment and you may be listening even today and if you have any struggle about your own salvation realize how simple the gospel is become as sinners recognize christ died for us rose and trust in him alone nothing else as we're on the way to heaven at that moment it gives us completely free to get to eternal life but the point is when you whatever method you use be sure it explains the gospel very clearly because you don't want to talk confusingly or God speaks clearly on such important issues in your own life. But those are the six things I would share with you. When it comes to what to do, you know, stay in your lane, know Christ understand, ask the right question, pray for another voice, concern all the means of communication, have a method of sharing the gospel. But I want to simply close this webinar by saying, there's no limit what God can do or who he can reach. God is unlimited. So do your part that's limited and ask God to do the unlimited part that he can do. You have limits for what you can do, but God has no limits with anyone anywhere. So do your limited part, ask God to do the unlimited part. I would simply do close by challenging you to do two, two things. Meditate on your own conversion and then pray for theirs. Meditate on your own conversion. Think of how God brought you to Christ. And many said, I cannot see that person ever come to Christ. Meditate on your own conversion. How God is walking away you never knew. And then pray for theirs. And may God use you in a great way in today's culture to bring family members to Christ. So having enjoyed them here, you can afford to enjoy them forever. Awesome. Thank you, Larry, for uh, Dr. Moore, for sharing uh, that with us. I hope you all got some very helpful ideas on how to reach relatives in the, in the coming days, weeks, months as, as uh, you meet and have them gather around the dinner table or Thanksgiving table or meet up with them for, for Christmas just to kind of think through um, some ideas and do's and don'ts of how to engage with them. As you see on the screen, I want to remind everybody of, of a new course that we're developing that's going to be releasing uh, later this year on reaching religious people. One of the things Dr. Moyer talked about is uh, how do we how do we engage with somebody who automatically says uh, they're a Christian, um, but we have some reason to believe that maybe, they, maybe they're not? Is, are there some, some ideas of, of how I can reach them, some questions I can ask, uh, some ways that I can approach them to have a great conversation that has more of an opportunity to lead to the gospel? And the answer to that is yes, there, are, there, there is, in addition to reaching people from other religions, whether it's uh, Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness or Islam or whatever it would be, there's specific ideas and tactics we can use to engage with them. If you go to evantel.org slash religious people, you know, you'll find a form there to fill out that, that will notify you when the course is available and we'll send you a discount code to get 25% off the, the course. It'll make the course only $15. Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to get some wonderful content uh, and to have a course that's gonna have a lot of opportunities to interact uh, with uh, some materials that we have, some downloadable resources, and just be able to be well equipped to engage people from uh, another uh, religion or 
worldview. Um, we actually don't have time for um, questions today, but I just ask if there are any questions, you can feel free to email us. You can go to avantel.org and go to the contact Avantel uh, section and send a question to us or send an email directly to avantel at avantel.org and we will answer any and all questions uh, that come in uh, regarding this topic as soon as we possibly can. We wanna make sure those questions get answered, but we also wanna be good stewards of your time. Um, and with that said, I just invite everybody to uh, visit vantel.org, check out the resources, check out the free trainings we have, uh, check out the courses we have, the blogs, the videos, so much there, uh, content that you can get on how to reach relatives, reach friends, reach family members, how to present the gospel clearly. And I, just, I hope and pray you take advantage of that and, and just um, get equipped uh, to share the gospel and, in a winsome way. And I uh, just uh, hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day, a wonderful rest of the week. And thank you for joining us today.